and you're in the New Testament, turn with me over tonight. We're going to be in Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. And i got to head in the right directions here uh, with my Bible. Philippians chapter 1, and we'll get back into this series. This series is Helping Your Church Grow. And we, what we have found as we look at these prayers that the Apostle Paul has uh, given and is prayed out to the saints and to the church that he pastored or helped pastor, you might say, through these young men that he was bringing along, Timothy, Titus, and some others. Here we, uh, we had been looking at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. We dealt with uh, to pray for perception, uh, and perception basically is to understand, to know uh, something. And so we want perception in our lives so we can grow. And what I'm saying is what we have found in these prayers is that it starts with you and I in our hearts, uh, in, in our lives, in our families, and then trickles to the church. Helping your church grow, one of the ways is starting with yourself. And so we want to encourage you by way of these devotions to encourage you to strengthen yourself. And so we started with the pray, prayer of perception. You need perception in your life as a Christian, especially today, especially now. And, uh, and then the second prayer we looked at in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, we said we need to pray for power. And we dealt with power, praying for power a Sunday evening. And it's very important. And that power come, uh, that come through understanding that we need, to, we need to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. Uh, the Bible said that in Galatians. We also looked at the fruit of the Spirit, how it's manifested. And we, we uh, used an illustration of that fruit is is seen. It's not something that you talk about. It's not really spiritual, although the, the Spirit of God begins to work in your life, but it manifests itself, the fruit of the Spirit, through love, what you do, through joy, through peace, through long-suffering, through gentleness, through meekness. And so you have these fruit that should be there. And so to receive the power, to get connected with the power of God, He, he wants us to have the power of the Spirit. The power of Christ's control in your life was the next thing that we looked at. And we need to understand that Christ does need to be in control of our lives. Uh, we spoke of the illustration of uh, like a house, your, your, your being, your mind, your heart, your conscience, what makes you up as a trichotomy, a body, soul, and spirit, your whole being should consist of God controlling every aspect of that. You say, well, I don't, I don't think he controls every aspect of that. Well, he should, and so this is an area where you could grow in. So God, we looked at God's control, his power of control in our lives. Then we looked at the outcome of those two aspects of power. Having the Spirit, yielding to the Spirit, gives us a connection with God's power, allowing God to control certain areas of our lives, not certain, all areas of our life. And then we see the outcome of that. You say, how do I know if the Holy Spirit's working in my life? Well, uh, you're going to exhibit power to love. Do you have the power to love one another. How about your family sitting right next to you this evening? How about the loved one that we raised in the prayer request? What about the neighbor that lives next to you? Hopefully you've been exhibiting your conversation, your daily life, and pleasing to God, a power to love. And we dealt with that. And then the last one we, we developed last time was the power of God's fullness. And I know I'm recapping, but I want to set the, the stage or the mood for this third one. And we looked at the power of His work in us or the working in us. And that was in Ephesians chapter 3, about verse 20 and 21. Now let's deal with Philippians. And our prayer tonight is uh, the prayer for performance. Yes, you know where this is going. Those that know me, I'm going to put the rubber on the tarmac. You need to be doing something. I need to be doing something. And so we, as we grow, this is what's going to be expected of you uh, from the Word of God. There is a duty, if you please. There's a call, and there should be a burden and a love to want to perform for the God you love, the God you say you serve, the God that saved your soul. And so we're looking at that tonight. The prayer for performance. We need to pray for performance. Philippians chapter 1, enough of that. Let's get into the Bible. Look at with me, look with me, verses 3, and we'll read down to verse 11. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. Verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work 
in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I love that verse. Verse 7, even as it is meet for me to thank this of you, of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my bonds and in the de defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are our partakers, uh, are partakers of my grace. Verse 8, for God is my record, how greatly I long after you, all in my bowels of Christ Jesus. For this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So we have a prayer here that, again, another prayer that the Apostle Paul has laid out, and he's telling uh, Philippi, the, church, uh, the Philippian church, that he, how he's praying for them. And so it breaks down basically verses 9 through 10, but let's get into this. Now let me say this first before we get into our, our point on this prayer. And this is the prayer of performance. Uh, according to verses 3 and 7, or 3 through 7, thanksgiving is a key ingredient in praying for others. It's very important as you study the prayers or prayer in the Bible, you'll find that thanksgiving is a very important part of prayers that you read about and find in scriptures. Here, we notice that there's a couple things here that is mentioned, and we're saying that thanksgiving is definitely a key uh, a key ingredient to praying for others. And so we're going to see some of the things that Paul, uh, Paul, what, what some of the things Paul was thankful for here. Now watch verse 3. We'll make this and we'll get to our first point. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. First of all, I want you to notice that he was thankful for the remembrance of these saints in Philippi. He was very thankful for, you know, I haven't seen uh, our church family in a good while. It's been, what, two, two and a half, maybe three, going on three weeks. And I know we've done these virtual live stream services, and I'm thankful for them, and we're learning, and we're going through, through a learning phase here with some of this digital technology. But uh, I miss seeing my church family. Uh, Brother Rogers was in earlier before we started the service, and he dropped some things off for the kitchen. And uh, I got to speak with him a little bit. We need to put him on our prayer list, by the way, Brother Ted, Ted Rogers. Uh, and so... Ted and uh, Sister Mary, and we talked, and it was good to see him, and I, I wanted to chat, we chatted just real briefly, but uh, it was good to see Brother Ted, and it's always good to see Brother Ted, but especially now, and uh, I miss seeing my church family, and so I can't wait until we actually have a service where we all can show up, uh, we have some good singing, and we have some good preaching and teaching, and maybe a meal, I don't know, I'll work on that part. But it might be a while. This might be longer than what we're thinking, and it's okay. Listen to your governor, and we'll move on through this by the power of God. But back on this, Paul was very thankful uh, that he remembered them here at Philippi. And he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. You know, uh, it says, uh, uh, the saying is, uh, hearts grow fonder apart. And it's one of those things where, you know, you remember past, uh, past remembrances, experiences, I was going to say, and hopefully good ones, but you remember the good ones and you think back, man, that's sweet to, to be able to remember uh, the good things. I understand the bad's pretty much there. <laughs> it always seems to stick around, uh, and it's a shame that it does. But the good things, remember the good things. The Bible even tells us to think on these things, lovely, just, pure, honest, good report. Think on these things. And at this time, uh, uh, what, with what we're facing, uh, our uh, state and our country, we need to be thinking on good things, positive things. But here, Apostle Paul, back, to, back on point here, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And I can be thankful in the remembrance of our church. And it won't be long where we'll be able to meet again. Let's move on. Notice with me, verse number 5, something else that he was thankful for. And he says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. 
uh, they were steadfast and continued uh, in the gospel. And he says the fellowship in the gospel. I long for that. I'm used to looking at faces here in the pews. I'm looking to uh, looking for the response from the people, and it's not there. You don't realize it until you don't have anybody here, and you're just you're basically speaking or preaching or teaching to the cameras. And uh, then the few that are in the media team here tonight. And I'm thankful for them, definitely. I'm not leaving you guys out. So thankful for you guys hearing your work and labor and love at this time. And uh, so here in verse 5, there's something else. Drop down to verse number 7. And it's in the latter part of verse 7. This is the third thing that I picked out here. He says in verse 7, Even as it is meet for me, excuse me, uh, he, he says, uh, Me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. And so he thought it was kind of nice and thankful uh, for them to be able to be partakers of his grace, the work that he had laid out, the, the lessons and the studying that he had laid out for these people and these saints here. He was thankful for this, for them to be a partaker of his grace. So having said all that, let's move to our first point. And we see here that this is a prayer of action. That's why we've entitled this, this prayer here, uh, a prayer for performance that you and I know and realize from scriptures that we must do and it's before us. And so here, number one, I want you to notice in verse number nine with me, read with me. Now I want you to read along with me. I can't hear you. Uh, you might be able to hear me, but read along with me. I'm in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. It says, In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Wow. So what is our first point under prayer for performance? It's abounding in love. It's abounding in love. What are some of the ways that Christians could love other Christians better? Well, the first thing I think of is you can pray for them. There's some, again, I've mentioned before, and I'll probably mention again before we're done here, there's some that need prayer right now. Uh, you more than likely can pick more, if not more than one person that you know personally that needs prayer. And whether they're lost or they're saved, they're going through a hard time, whatever the case may be, there's people who need prayer. And so as we look at this prayer, and we're calling it the prayer of performance, or for performance. We're going to see point number one, abounding in love. One of the ways you can love a Christian, uh, your brothers and sister, is to pray for them. You know, this will work the other way. Uh, if you have an enemy, <laughs> you say, you have an enemy? I, not that I know of, but I'm sure there's somebody out there, might even be listening tonight, that doesn't necessarily like me. That is okay. That, they have the right to do that. Uh, that is okay. But you can pray for them. Uh, there's people that I've known that haven't liked me or I might not have liked them as well. And I learned this from my pastor, Pastor Tom. Pray for them. Begin to pray this way. And this is one of, one of the things I pray for those type of people is God Pray for this individual. I pray that you would bless them. Not only bless them spiritually, but physically. Give them health. Strengthen them. Bless them financially. Bless them with being able to fulfill their dreams. Bless their family. And Father, make a way for them. Watch out for them. You say, you pray that way? That's the way I pray for my enemies. I know this, that they need prayer. And you know what? I find after about six, seven months of that, my heart begins to change towards that person. I have seen it happen the other way where that person, knowing that they not really like me very well or just don't care for them, whatever the case may be, I don't know. Uh, but they begin to change. Their attitude changes. You're like, well, we don't really have a problem here at all. Just, uh, just different people. Continue to pray for them. Even for, yes, yes, even for your enemies if you have one. All right, so hopefully you don't have... <laughs> have too many of them. Abounding in love. How can that happen? Well, let me say this. What hinders us from loving other Christians better? I'll tell you what hinders you and I from loving other Christians better. 
It's a lack of love, a lack or zeal or burden or desire to want to be a performing type Christian. Now, when I say performing type, I mean somebody who's willing to go the extra mile sacrificially for another brother or sister or a lost person. And it's very important that we show that in our lives whenever we can. And so we say, what can hinder us? A lack of love can hinder you. And so we want to abound in love as, as he's saying here that he, that he prayed this. He says, in this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. We'll get into the latter part of that here a little bit. But why is love for God and other Christians something we should desire for others as we pray? It's important because if you don't have that heart of love or heart of attitude, there's something that will not connect the Holy Spirit's not able to do His job because remember, His fruit is love, the first one. And so when that's lacking in our life and inside our hearts is what I'm speaking of, there's a lack of performance in you. Oh, you might be going through the motions through your physical part, but your heart and your mind's not in it. And, and there, you say, why? It's because the love is not abounding in your life. And it should, and this is the prayer. You say, well, I, I want to do something for God, but I don't have the burden. I'm, I'm burnt out or don't have a desire. Is that normal? That's, that can be normal. One of the reasons would be your love is not abounding in your heart and in your life. That would be one of the reasons. We're going to look at some other ones here. But I have some questions, and I put a lot of questions to this. How does knowing others' needs help us to love others better? Well, there's a lot of people who have a lot of needs. You can't meet every need. Uh, we have limited sources, resources. But uh, there are some that we're able to meet. And those that God lays on your heart, remember there's needs. And when you can meet those needs, you show forth God's love one towards another. And I'm speaking of a performance, not like, uh, I love this individual, so I'm not only going to pray for him, that's about it. If they have a need, meet that need if you're able to meet that need. So meeting the needs of your brothers and sisters is very important. And so we, we want to make sure that, he says there in the latter part of 9, notice with me now, he says, he, says, uh, he says, in this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment. Uh, a lot of, lot of Christians, you and I, we lack judgment in the right areas. I understand we can judge whether we want two eggs or three eggs in the morning, whether we like dark roast or light roast coffee. You know I'd get around the coffee and ice cream. Uh, what kind of flavor of ice cream you like. Those are judgments. Those are discernments. And, and basically those uh, are geared around your, how you're made up. And so what you feel, what, what you want. But in your judgments here, the Apostle Paul is talking about your judgments on what you're doing, what you're not doing. It's your actions that he's looking at. You want to be careful because you might make an innocent judgment one way when somebody else is watching you that wants to be a partaker of the grace and the love of God, but all of a sudden there's a hindrance there because you have misjudged something. It might be innocent. It might be an innocent thing. But another person that is weaker or is needing some more love you don't display it. You have to be careful with that. Yes, that is shouldered on yours and I responsibility that work and want to grow. Now, if you don't want to grow, just listen for a few more minutes or go watch something else. But if you want to grow, you have a desire to want to grow in God, you want to make sure that you are abounding with this love, all right, abounding in love. So you want to be able to make right judgment, a discernment, he says there, knowledge in all judgment. You want to have a knowledge in judgment. Not to be ignorant in your judgment making. All right, and that can be from A to Z. We won't get into that. Let's move on to our second point. A second point. Verse number 10. Verse number 10. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Now, verse 10 goes with verse 9. Uh, you'll see that he says that he wants this love to abound more and more in verse 9. Then he says, and he wants you to have knowledge in all judgment that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. This is what we're talking about when we speak of the knowledge in your judgment making. And we're going to say abounding in choice and godly living. Uh, you'll never find an individual, an individual growing for God or growing in God that doesn't take or understand that holiness or godly living is a part of that. 
The Bible speaks of this in many different ways. One of the illustrations is about a well. It says that a well can't bring forth bitter water and sweet water at the same time. Uh, it says this in another place that a man cannot serve God and mammon. He would either, and mammon was a type of like money. And in, that, in the context it was, it was written in, and he says, either love mammon or love God. He won't serve both of them. You can't serve both of them. I know we have Christians walking about that they try to make the disguise that they're serving both of them successfully. And they, they make a mockery of the word of God. It's not, it doesn't go on. And so we find that if we're going to grow, if we're going to take these prayers to heart, and we look at these points abounding in choice and godly living. Uh, we understand that there should, there should be no impurities in our lives. So were you talking about sinless perfection? Absolutely not. Any little bit of sense will take you to the point of understanding you have a problem. And just because you got saved, it didn't take care of your problem. Uh, there's eternity taken care of. Uh, there's the sealing of the Holy Spirit. But we can quench and we can grieve and we can ignore the, the, the working of God on our lives to grow. And this is where we're at tonight. We're talking about making or abounding in the right choices and in godly living. Uh, there should be no impurities in our lives. There should be no hidden agendas or sins that are dishonoring to the Lord. So these God will begin to work on in your life. Uh, from one person, it'll be different from the other person. But the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, kind of what we were on uh, in the previous lesson, He begins to work in your life. He works in your heart and your conscience by, through the Word of God, through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. He says, you need to correct that. You need to begin to work on that. That's weak. That's wrong. That's not right. This is what we're talking about. And so there shouldn't be any agendas or sins that are dishonoring to God. We say this, a Christian can be an offense to other Christians. You say, wow, they can? Oh yeah, it goes on every day. <laughs> Sometimes by the hour. And you say, well, is that, that's just the way that it is. No, that's, it shouldn't be that way. You should have a, a spirit or a heart of restoration. And, and, and it should be abounding in love. And this is what we're speaking about, about growing. But I don't want to grow. Growing pains aren't always fun. But uh, this is a time and opportunity to grow. A Christian can be an offense to unbelievers. I have actually witnessed this go on many times. A Christian can be an offense to unbelievers. See, how does that happen? You have co-workers and people you work around. Hopefully you're still working. And those that aren't, hopefully you, you, get, you get a job. Or you get your job back. We get to go back. And so you work around people who are not saved. Uh, maybe people you've witnessed to in the past. Maybe people you're trying to develop a relationship to witness to them. Uh, a little bit harder to catch, you, if, you, if you please, uh, to win to Christ. And so you can be an offense to an unbeliever. And this is not a good thing because that offense is like an offended brother, the Bible says, is like uh, trying to win back a strong city. And it's hard to do, sometimes impossible. I've heard this from a lost person, I'll never go to that church or I'll never become a Christian because of what that individual did or what that individual said or whatever that individual was doing or not doing. And it generally was something that was ungodly or not right anyways. And so uh, it's sad. You know, even the lost world, an unbeliever, will expect way more out of you than another Christian will. They honestly will, and this is where we're at, abounding in choice and godly living. So let's go to our third point. Notice with me verse number three. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Now watch this. We want to say thirdly, abounding in fruitfulness. There are a lot of Christians that are saved. Uh, they'll say that they love God in a verbal aspect of things, and, but their life is not filled with fruit. There isn't fruit. And, and, and the fruit that you might see might be shriveled up or dried or soured, you might say, or rotten. You say, what is wrong? They have ceased to want to grow. They, they, their desire or burden to want to love God more, uh, maybe even we're speaking tonight of the prayer, uh, the prayer of performance, they don't want nothing to do with doing any type of ministry or working or furthering the gospel. Their desire's not there. Their heart is cold or uh, shut up. 
uh, maybe due to hurt, maybe due to just the lack of getting in the Bible and studying and rekindling that relationship with God. But we're talking about abounding in fruitfulness. A lot of Christians do not portray the fruit, especially the fruit, it says the fruits of righteousness. And so in what way should Christians be fruitful? Many different ways. There are lots of different ways that the Bible lays out. You say, I want to grow. Are you abounding in the fruits of righteousness in your life? Because you have a family more than likely that is watching you, uh, that is looking to you to make right decisions and right choices. And so make the right one why it counts. And then here in the church, we have one another that we're accountable to uh, before under God. And we want to make right choices and not wrong choices. Abounding in fruitfulness, we're saying. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness of Jesus Christ. God gets glory when we are truly fruitful. That's who gets the glory. Not you and I, uh, not the world, definitely, not other Christians per se, but God gets the glory, and that's where it should be. All right, that is our last point for this evening. And uh, so we're, we, tonight we've looked at the prayer of performance. And you might say it this way, pray for performance. You can say it that way. We're praying for performance, and the Apostle Paul surely was. And he was laying it out to the Philippian people here in Philippians chapter 1. Now we have one more uh, set in this series, and it's part 4 of helping your church grow. Hopefully this has been a help. Hopefully you're, you're thinking about growing. Hopefully maybe you even made steps to grow a little bit uh, this week as we look at these verses and these prayers as we laid out. Now as we close... What I want to do is I want to pray and then I'll make some announcements and then we'll be off air and you guys enjoy the rest of your, of your evening. And so let's, let's close this devotion in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow before you again and we thank you for your word and Father for this prayer, short prayer that the Apostle Paul laid out here to the Philippian people. And Father, we're thankful for, uh, to see that, hey, we can pray for performance, for our actions to become stronger in this area, to help us grow. And I, I pray that you would give us those areas in our lives that we need to grow in. And Father, we, uh, we pray that your word would stay in our hearts and stay in our minds. And Father, as we are praying again, we want to bring our prayer petition up. And those that need prayer, those that have lost loved ones, those that have lost uh, loved ones to this uh, virus, and uh, Father, we want to pray for them, those that are ba battling other sicknesses. Father, lift them up tonight. We want to bring them up before you tonight. And uh, be with them, bless them. Be with our services coming up Sunday. And uh, Father, we uh, ask all this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So hopefully you're still with us here 